Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. The leaven hidden in the meal. That's what we're going to be talking about. I appreciate your interest in this new series on parables. I'm going to be looking at Matthew 13, 33. There's a, a parallel verse of Luke 13, 21 that deals with the same parable. Uh, if you believe that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament, it, then you believe that God divided his program into time segments. Uh, we call those dispensations, and it's important that we identify uh, these time periods in order to see God's purpose for each. Uh, Adam to Moses uh, is what uh, Paul uh, spoke of. Uh, John spoke of Moses to Christ. The times of the Gentiles uh, was mentioned by Christ. Uh, the last days for Israel was mentioned by Isaiah. Uh, the last days for the church was mentioned by Paul to, to, in 2 Timothy. Uh, Israel was set aside in unbelief. Uh, this present age that we're living in is distinct from all pre preceding ages. Uh, Israel's blindness uh, that the Gentiles might be brought into relation to God was a mystery. Uh, the incarnation itself was called a mystery. Uh, as was the church. The church was also called a mystery. Uh, and this is what I believe it means to study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Dividing the word of truth. There's a reason for parables. The text is clear as to what that reason was. Uh, Matthew 13, 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? We know from the text that they rejected Christ. Things were about to change. There was, about, uh, there was going to be a change of dispensations. Uh, we have to look at these things in context. The Jews had just accused Jesus of being a son of Satan. Uh, he called them an evil and adulterous generation. Why speak to them in parables? Well, Matthew 13, verses 34 and 35, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, in order that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. I think the text makes it clear that it was a method of imparting truth to the one who would hear. We have something similar today. That's the Holy Spirit enlightening us to the truth of His Word. And so he answered, and he says unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. His sheep hear his voice. Those who are not his cannot hear. Matthew 13, 13 through 15, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you, ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted. He's talking about his people, Israel, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. He's talking about his people. 
you open up the book of Matthew, folks, and it's, it's all, it, we read about the Messiah, Israel, the law, the kingdom. Uh, Matthew has a Jewish tone. Uh, it uses Jewish terminology and Jewish ideas. We go over to Mark. Well, Mark wrote to the Roman. Luke wrote to the Greek. And if, if failure in making these dis distinctions results in a, in a fatal error of, of our saying that Israel has become the church. All Scripture was written for us, but not all Scripture was written to us. But God didn't abandon His own people. He didn't reject His covenant with Israel. Look at the church as a parenthesis in God's dealing with His people Israel, which, which thank God for His wisdom, was made future so that salvation could come to you and I, could come to us Gentile. Now it's now it's Jews and Jews and Gentiles alike, one body in Christ, the body of Christ. The spiritual kingdom is composed of the elect of all ages, and it that's it, it can't be entered into except through new birth. Now the millennial kingdom, which is earthly. Uh, it's the subject of Old Testament pro prophecy. It was, it was proclaimed as being at hand when Christ came, okay, the first time, but was rejected by Israel and therefore postponed. The world will see another John the Baptist. I mean, it, it's, I, I use that as a, as, a, as a metaphor for the gospel of the kingdom once again being preached once the church age the church age the dispensation of grace ends uh, matthew 23 uh, o jerusalem jerusalem thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee how often would i have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He's talking about Israel. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This is yet future. We've got two phrases in Scripture, kingdom of God. We've got kingdom of, of, of heaven. That's literally kingdom of the heavens, plural. These are not synonymous, even though they are used interchangeably. Their meaning is to be determined by context. Kingdom of the heavens, plural, holds a, a particular significance because it, it encompasses all of creation, earthly as well as heavenly, you know, God's will on earth uh, will be done as God's will as, as it is on earth as it is in heaven. You know, everything that you could think of and more. Uh, and w however we interpret these parables, they have to be consistent that with all of Scripture. It has to be in harmony with all of Scripture. Nothing can contradict anything else. So Matthew 13, 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like, here's what it's like, unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of weeded meal, says the text, that, that word is weeded meal, till the whole was leavened. When you introduce leaven into the meal, an irreversible process begins that will continue until it, it's completed its leavening action. All right, this is, in, this, is, this is obviously intended to stress the way that the new form of the kingdom will develop. The power in the kingdom will not be external. but internal. So, you, you know, say goodbye to, to weapons of war.
say goodbye to earthly governments. Because by its internal working, it will affect an external transformation. And that's, folks, is what leaven does. So now we're beginning to see that the picture of that parable is beginning to sh take shape. Just like law can't transform a believer's life. But we all with open face beholding as in a, in a mirror the glory of the Lord, that's what we're beholding, are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 I find that interest that three measures of meal interesting. That three measures of meal was the amount used by Sarah to bake bread when, when, when she and Abram were visited by the Lord and the angels in Genesis 18. It, it also happens to be the amount used in baking the showbread for the temple of the Lord in Israel. I think the Holy Spirit wants us to enter the household of a first century woman in order to gain perspective on the household of God. This, this kingdom, this, the new kingdom will flourish not by military might like, like all previous kingdoms were, but by a new principle which is the power within so the parable stresses the growth of the new form of the kingdom. The kingdom will be transformed from the inside out, not the outside in. That's just what leaven does. It's where, it's where the picture of leaven comes in. If Christ had not hid leaven, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that's the gospel in his kingdom, it would not have risen. That word hid means to bury or to hide within. And it is used only of the kingdom of God as it spreads its unstoppable influence, yet it's not readily detected. Uh, most people just don't know what's going on. I think it's stressing the kingdom is growing not by external influences, but by inward change, which will affect outward external transformation. The nations benefit by the kingdom. Three measures of meal was the amount used by Sarah to bake bread when, when, when her and, and Abram were visited by the Lord. And you know, that amount, they say that that amount would have fed 100 people. Three measures. It's also the amount used in, in baking the showbread for the temple. It, it seems to have this connotis, sort of a connotation uh, to a relationship with the kingdom. Uh, that number 100 often represents the kingdom. Uh, it represents other things, but it often represents the kingdom. God promises that in the millennium, people will be able to live to be a hundred. That's, that's, we read that in Isaiah chapter 65. Uh, they say that Paul's 14 books contain 100 chapters. I don't know if that's true or not. I find that interesting. The, the parable ends with, with till the whole was leavened. Okay, look, it all started with 12 men in an obscure corner of Galilee that, that spread, that it, this has spread throughout the world. The gospel makes progress. Hid in the wheat and flour. That leaven is unstoppable. 
the kingdom of the heavens, which encompasses all of God's created order, a kingdom without end, with our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life. You know, the, this whole leaven thing, you know, this, I mean, you're, you know, we're looking at the baking of bread. Uh, we know that our Lord is the bread of life. You know, I just think that's, that's marvelous. There's nothing in that parable for you to do. This, this parable, I'm starting out with this, it's, it's in, in, at least in my opinion, it's probably one of the more simple parables to understand in context when you look at it in in, in relationship to where it is in Scripture, it's in Matthew, it's, it's, there was no church. Uh, we're looking at uh, a, a picture here of Christ having come and to his, unto His own, but His own received Him not. And Israel was set aside in unbelief. God turned His attention to the Gentiles. We, we, we have to be most grateful for that or that now it's Jew and Gentile, one body in Christ. So this is talking about how the, what the kingdom is like. And that phrase, the kingdom, that he uses is literally the kingdom of the heavens, plural. Now, don't ask me why that the translators don't put, say that, you know. But obviously, they, these scholars know the difference between a singular and a plural. But... All you have to do is look at it to see that it is kingdom of the heavens. Now, when I, when I see that phrase, kingdom of the heavens, I'm looking at it all, everything. I mean, in heaven, on earth, kingdom of the heavens. That's a lot different than the kingdom on earth, the thousand-year reign of Christ. It includes that, but it is not limited to that. There is a spiritual kingdom, and most often the word kingdom of God is associated with this spiritual kingdom. You know, you know, we must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. So we need to define terms as we go along through this study with these parables. We need to define terms. We need to make sure that we're looking at the context. You know, are we looking at a time before Christ uh, died on the cross, before there was a church? Uh, are we looking at... Uh, most of the parables are positioned in Scripture there before there ever was a church. But that does not mean there's not a present day application for the church in some of these parables. So we will look at more of these parables in part two. I'm gonna kind of go play this by ear here, uh, see how many people are interested. I'm more than happy to, to, to uh, address subjects that, that, that viewers bring up. If you want to put in the comments down below, if any of you watching this want to, want to make a suggestion on, on some parable that you'd like to see me address, I'll try to do my best with that. Um, I am no source of truth, but I do believe that these parables can be understood uh, correctly in context. We are still waiting for our Lord re to return. Uh, I believe that that could happen at, at any moment. We are, we I believe, are at a critical point in human history, where that uh, it would be a, an enormous mistake on our part to go to sleep and to stop watching for our Lord's return. So once again, let me know if you have any comments, questions. Write me, email me, message me, Facebook me, and. Uh, 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 Nothing would make me happier than to try to address some of your concerns. And it doesn't have to deal with just parables. It can be any question. Uh, we've just completed our series in 1 Corinthians. That was a wonderful study. Uh, I, would, I would like to, to go away from verse by verse, strictly verse by verse teaching for just a little while to do some uh, topical, uh, uh, sub, address some topical subjects. Uh, that might interest some of our viewers. That's kind of where we're at right now. Here's one of the major problems I think Christians have in interpreting the Scripture in the New Testament. First of all, there's an enormous attraction uh, to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? And especially the red-letter words of our Lord. Uh, 
I'm not a big fan of those red letter words. Uh, uh, many would argue, well, this, this is, these were words, the very words of our Lord himself. Well, uh, I, I'm going to suggest that there's not any part of scripture that's not a, the word of God. And so n no, no parts of scripture are, are any more important than any other. But many Christians today spend their time in Matthew, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is where you'll find most of these parables. They don't spend hardly any time in Paul's epistles, which is, which is what I believe is the lifeblood of the church uh, today. It's, it's where we, we, under, we come to understand doctrine, which is very life-changing. Uh, if you want to spend your life in the synoptic gospels and you, and you, and you hardly, because you love the stories or whatever reason, and you don't ever get all over past acts into Romans through Jude or Philemon, uh, you know, uh, Paul's epistles. And if you don't spend much time in Paul's epistles, I don't think that you're going to, to under to gain a full realization of just who you are in Christ. Because in the, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you don't have that information. Uh, you've got to look at this in, in historical context. It's not difficult to believe that Christ came on the scene. He presented himself as Israel's Messiah, as their, as their king, and Israel rejected Christ. There was a lot of teaching there. There's a lot of teaching there, but we've got to rightly divide between what applies to the church and what applies to Israel. Uh, this is why I'm called, I call myself, and, and strictly speaking, I'm called a dispensationalist. You're either dispensational or you're non-dispensational. If you say that you're non-dispensational and you don't draw that distinction, then basically what you're saying is that there were uh, we can go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we can see instructions given to the church, even though the church didn't exist at that time. Uh, it, it would be just as goofy, I think, to go over into Paul's epistles and read those as if, as if all of that truth pertained to Israel, because it doesn't. So hopefully you understand where I'm coming from with that. It's an important uh, division to make, to when we're told to rightly divide uh, the, the truth of the Word of God. So let's, let's end with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your, for your love, your forgiveness, for your life that you've given us, for the eyes that, that you've given us to see, the hearts that you've, you've given us to hear. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you, which is foolish and ignorant, but just seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you, for that is our desire. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So until next time, rest in Him. I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.